There aren't enough zombies in the show. The show has too much woke filler. The show is pointless if you've already played the game, so why bother? When it comes to complaints I've heard concerning the show, these three statements are what I've seen the most. And with every single one of them, I heavily disagree. And while I do see where they're coming from, it's evident that these thoughts are misguided, for the most part. In general, I feel these positions stem from a lack of media literacy and not understanding what the show is trying to achieve. And it's not like The Last of Us is this avant-garde show that requires you to be this snooty art critic in order to enjoy it. The Last of Us's narrative is as straightforward as it gets, and its simplicity is how it garnered such a broad appeal. And they've managed to win over this audience in such a tired and derivative genre by being a show all about love. Yes, the zombie show is about love, but let's put a pin in that for now and let's address the most reasonable statement out of this pile, which is why. Why does this show exist? I mean, we know why, the trends, the profits, all that stuff, but from an artistic standpoint, why create the show? Like, isn't this basically no different to a Disney remake? It would be redundant, right? The Last of Us is presented to look like a modern film and TV show thanks to its cinematic aesthetic. And as far as games go, it's a linear experience. There's no chance of missing out on major plot points or getting a different ending. It's not Dark Souls, you know? Also, Joel is a fixed character, not a blank slate. He is a character with character and a fixed personality. This isn't Disco Elysium where Joel can be a self-flagellating racist superstar cop who is more powerful without his shirt. So with how fixed the story of The Last of Us is, can't you just YouTube Last of Us cutscenes only and basically get the same experience as the player? No, not really. Controlling Joel is a different experience to watching Joel, and your emotions are, ideally, heightened when you yourself are the one playing the game. This also means mundane activities are more immersive as a participant than a viewer. This is because interaction is inherently more engaging than passively watching, and watching a playthrough that lacks the pacing of a tightly edited show isn't as an interesting experience. If you think it's boring solving a dumpster puzzle, imagine watching it. Watching these moments isn't necessary, and there's a reason movies and shows don't show every step of the journey. This would be an inefficient use of time, and it would be irrelevant to the plot. And if something is relevant to the plot, watching a character walk forward while listening to dialogue isn't as interesting seeing an actor act for the viewer. And if you're watching a cutscene-only playthrough, you're missing out on a significant chunk of story missed through gameplay. There are notes to read that flesh out the game setting, there is optional dialogue that rewards exploration, and gameplay is used to reinforce your relationships with characters. But if you don't really care about reading notes, don't care about optional dialogue, and don't care about taking in the scenery, then even this cutscene-only playthrough is going at a pace that'll include elements that you don't really care about. So an adaptation should, ideally, incorporate these elements seamlessly into a passive medium without feeling bloated while still being relevant to the story. And that's why the redundant and Disney remake arguments have no footing, because no matter how linear you perceive this game, you aren't going from a linear animated story to a linear live action story, which, in theory, is fairly simple to do. But, in this case, you're going from a medium that requires participation to a medium that lacks any of it. That's why books and theater are able to translate their stories more easily, and enough decades have passed for them to figure out that process. So it isn't all that surprising to see another critically acclaimed movie based on a play or novel, whether massive liberties are taken or not. Whereas games as a medium is relatively new, and game adaptation even newer, so the industry is still figuring this out. And while the video game adaptation curse has been lifted, HBO's adaptation is a bit different. While something like Arcane is both a critical and audience darling, the show didn't adapt a story mode from the game. It adapted lore. And that's what the Mario, Sonic, Castlevania adaptations did. 
There were no specific beats to follow like a manga for an anime, it's more like the universe and the paratext of the game has been adapted into what we've seen. Whereas with The Last of Us, there is a clear story to adapt here. It has a protagonist, a plot, and an aesthetic that is easier to translate than most games. To fumble such an opportunity would look really dumb, you know? So then you have this balancing act of keeping true to the game's story while implementing the elements that people might miss out on. So was this adaptation harder to adapt than something like the Mario movie? That's debatable. But the real question is, how did the adaptation do? Was it any good? Yeah, it's good. It's really, really good. Great at times. And I want to praise this adaptation for how it deviates from the game, and how the show uses its medium strengths for the better. And one of the most obvious benefits by going from game to show is being able to switch to different point of views more liberally. While this isn't impossible for video games, it's just the intimate direction of The Last of Us makes it hard to do that outside of specific circumstances. And if done poorly, it can make the game feel a bit jarring. But in the context of a show, we're a viewer, not a participant. That means we're not stuck so strictly to our protagonists, since it's easier to mentally orient yourself whenever the point of view changes as a viewer. And with this freedom, that means we can step outside of our protagonist's POV, and have the opportunity to world build and flesh out characters without having our main duo needing to be present. And that means it allows the show to explore themes of love in ways the game couldn't. Speaking of which, let's revisit this again. Did you know that The Last of Us is a story about love? Not the warm bodies kind of love, but specifically how great and awful love can be. From the very beginning, the 2013 game was a way to explore the beautiful and dark aspects of love, which is a message the show faithfully carries over. And to quote Drunkman on the official podcast of the show, At the root of it all, xenophobia and all types of hate stems from love. It's beautiful, but it's a primal feeling, which leads to people acting irrationally. And this lines up with The Last of Us, right? Whether it be through Joel's decision to save Ellie, how Ellie's relationship with Riley has impacted her, to the other cast of characters that display their love in varying amounts of levels, love has always been at the core of the narrative. And if this theme wasn't effective, and if you weren't sold on Joel's love for Ellie, then the emotional climax of the show wouldn't have worked. And while the finale has Joel's most powerful and primal moment, I mentioned earlier that some changes introduced to the show are able to explore the theme of love in new ways. Now, this isn't to say that one medium is inherently better than the other, it's all about using the medium to the best of its ability. And the show really knocks it out of the park in certain episodes. And nowhere is this more obvious than with a certain character. It's one of the biggest changes that the show introduces that highlights the love through line in the most explicit way. And it's episode three, Long Long Time. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. I live in this world, you live in a psycho bunker where 9-11 was an inside job and, and the government are all Nazis. The government are all Nazis! Well, yeah, now, but not then. This episode is a highlight for me because it offered something that I haven't seen in a post-apocalypse story, or at the very least, one done this well. And what it offered me was that despite the worldwide disaster, that it's still possible for people to live relatively normally and live a full life. This wasn't a utopian society that all of a sudden all hell broke loose, or a seemingly totally normal family that had obviously different motivations. Instead, the episode showed two people who found the strength to live through each other's love. It wasn't perfect, they had their qualms and squabbles, but they didn't just survive, they lived. And they didn't just live, they lived full lives and died with content. Completely unrelated to the cordyceps or other people, it was just age. Now compare this to the game, where the intent of Bill was to be a reflection of what Joel could have been if he was an emotionally closed survivalist. AKA a person who is surviving, but isn't thriving. Which, in my belief, is a worn out trope that I don't much care for. Game Bill has the emotional depth of first act Elsa from Frozen, so Joel seeing this potential reflection isn't all that interesting to me. And while Bill's presence helps progress Joel and Ellie's relationship, 
I think his absence is more meaningful, and it's all because of this letter. Bill's letter proves a couple of things to Joel. One, life is worth living even if there's just one person to care for. And two, even as someone as reliable and safe and conservative as Bill won't always be around. Time is limited, so live the best life you can. And Bill, with the assumption that Tess is still alive, wrote this letter to make sure that Joel understood what he was living for. But due to her recent death, Joel is obviously conflicted, since he has to face the reality of losing someone so close to him. While Tess being romantically involved with Joel is debatable, it's undeniable that Tess meant something to Joel, and the only remnant that's left of her is hope. The hope that she had for Ellie and their mission to find the Fireflies. And that's why I like this change a lot. It's more emotionally impactful since we actually get to see Joel confront his grief for Tess. And not only is show Bill's situation more novel and captivating to me than game Bill, it also subverts the whole barrier gay stereotype, where being gay is a tragedy that's integral to a character's arc. Instead, these dudes are able to be emotionally honest with each other, and the pain doesn't come from hiding their homosexuality. The pain, instead, comes from them being emotionally vulnerable. The pain comes from wanting to protect someone you love, but also not suffocating the person with whom you fell in love with in the first place. This isn't some Soldier 76 is gay situation and Disney's first gay character brownie points pandering. This is an episode with something to say. It isn't eluded like in the game, he's undeniably gay, and I find that vulnerability more interesting than what game Bill offered. And on top of all that, it's fantastically performed, I think it's the best shot episode of this series, and I think it's just one of my favorite episodes of TV to come out in recent memory. So that's why I disagree with the argument that this episode is just some woke filler. Filler implies a lack of story progression and exploration of themes, but long long time provided both. And if people want to dismiss me and say that I only like this episode because I like woke gay stuff, then they haven't seen my channel. I've ripped apart games that these same people would say panders to wokeism, and I don't care about stories that pander to beliefs that I hold, especially if they're poorly made. And that's assuming that thinking gays existing in the apocalypse is some sort of political belief. I'm sure they would exist whether we were homophobic or not. But whatever, all I'm trying to say is, gay people exist, awful gay stories exist, mediocre gay stories exist, Long Long Time is a great episode of The Last of Us, it just so happens to feature a gay couple. And that's it. But let's say you're not blinded by bigotry and acknowledge that you like the episode, but you personally wanted more action and horror. You wanted more zombies. It's a post-apocalyptic show that features zombies, so where are the zombies? While this isn't an uncommon complaint, I still think these complaints are a little misplaced. From the melancholy intro, Joel and Ellie's relationship getting the most screen time, to literally the title of the thing you're watching, I feel like the show is letting you know where its priorities lie. There's no rug pull here, even on the Wikipedia page it doesn't label itself as a horror. Zombies aren't a genre, they are a narrative device, and they've been used for comedies, kids movies, and even an idol anime. Zombies are a flexible concept, and you can do whatever you want with them. And in The Last of Us's case, it uses zombies to explore love and relationships. This isn't like World War Z, where the relationships feel like an afterthought compared to the set pieces. But hey, let's play around with the idea and just add more zombie scenarios. You then have to ask yourself, what does this add to the story? At the very least, it's more superficially exciting, right? Another obstacle to overcome for our protagonists. But if the addition of zombies doesn't explore anything character-wise, then you've got filler. And while filler can be fun, it doesn't push the narrative or themes of the show forward. And remember, filler is bad. Even these guys said so. Because if they think mindless zombie filler is fine, but consider episode 3 as bad filler, then you've got a person showing their true colors. But to get back on the topic at hand, a zombie show plagued with filler is just the worst aspects of The Walking Dead. And I don't want The Walking Dead, since we already have like, what, 11 seasons of it? 
plus more? And thankfully, The Last of Us is attempting to elevate itself beyond superficial expectations. The show isn't just about zombie set pieces and our characters barely scraping through. It's a show about love, and this isn't some pretentious fart-sniffing ploy to make you feel smart, right? More often than not, great shows aren't just cosplaying their favorite genre to explore their tropes with skin-deep depth. Instead, good stories tend to use their tropes to try to say something that can be achieved through that specific genre. If that weren't the case, you'd have season 1 Jesse from Breaking Bad being a goofball for 12 seasons. And that sounds like fun, don't get me wrong, but Jesse's arc and change says something about the show where his stagnation can't. The same way The Wire isn't about catching drug dealers or The Sopranos isn't about how cool Italian gangsters are, The Last of Us isn't just about zombies and surviving. The zombies and the post-apocalypse are a frame to tell a story, and sometimes the lack of zombies is done to aid in that story. And speaking about the lack of zombies, let's talk about Episode 7, Left Behind, based on the DLC. Now I will admit here, as a whole, I prefer the DLC over the episode. I think the acting and chemistry is better in the game than in the show, and there were a lot of cute moments that I preferred through gameplay, as opposed to how it was translated as a passive viewer. But despite me liking the original more overall, the adaptation is able to communicate the theme of love in a particular scene in a more intimate way than the game. And I'm specifically talking about how Riley and Ellie get bitten. In the game, there's quite a number of cordyceps that seemingly come out of nowhere, and they are actively chasing our characters. And we know why it's done this way. This is a video game, and a lot of people play video games for the sake of action and excitement. Go watch Leon's video to see how our expectations and perception of combat in games got to this point. Now don't misunderstand me, I think video games don't need action sequences to make me feel like it's worth my time. One of my favorite games is mostly just reading and decision making, and I argue how that can be more engaging than some Hollywood wannabe video games. But in the context of The Last of Us as DLC, action is to be expected. While the gameplay between Ellie and Riley is a cute twist on the gameplay's mechanics, people may be a bit disappointed if there wasn't some sort of build-up towards an action sequence at the end. And due to how you progress in games, harder is often associated with more or stronger enemies. And thus, something like Riley and Ellie's moment is interrupted by a bunch of zombies instead of like, one? Because that feel very underwhelming. And this is fine, I have my complaints with the original game overall, but as a third-person action-adventure shooter, I think this climax makes sense. But in the adaptation, the show wanted to do something different by just having one zombie ruin their moment. While I personally like the change since adding another zombie horde scene would feel redundant at this point, the main reason for this change was to explore how difficult it is to acquire that love and normalcy we take for granted now. As much as we can, we give our characters the things they want the most and then we punish them for getting them. And we want them to be challenged by their darkest fears. And so one of the fears that you have in this world is that you're never safe enough to have fun. You're never safe enough to fall in love. You're never safe enough to have a first kiss. All it takes is one cordyceps to ruin it all. One dormant cordyceps that awakens at the sound of a couple of tweens enjoying each other's time, fueled by their awkward romance. We've already seen hordes of zombies ruin lives, so this scene shows us how easy it is for everything to fall apart. It just takes one. And this change shows how aware the showrunners are of their material. There's an understanding of the difference between video games and television, and have adapted the narrative with artistic intent. One isn't inherently better than the other in isolation, and it's all about seeing the different avenues to explore the same themes. It's a show that's not reliant on you knowing the source material, and it's a story that old fans will enjoy through this new interpretation. You're not getting a cash-grab live-action Disney remake, you're getting an adaptation that's being adapted with thought and care. It's a narrative about love, and it's always been that way. 
That's why episodes 3 and 7 exist. It shows how beautiful and devastating it is to love someone in the apocalypse that differs from Joel and Ellie's relationship, while also adding something to their relationship. And I think that's neat. And speaking of neat, I just want to quickly mention some stuff that I like about the show. I'm a big fan of Petro Pascal's interpretation of Joel, even more so than Troy Baker's. They're both great, but I think Pascal's warmth has more charm than Baker's. Beefaroni, Chef Boyardee. Oh, cool. With the reduced violence and zombies in the show, I think it makes the final rescue scene for Ellie more impactful in comparison. You're strangling, shooting, and bashing a huge number of bodies in the game anyway, so Joel rescuing Ellie from a bunch of guys isn't as impactful from a visual and mechanical standpoint. As opposed to the show, when he decides to go all in, it feels more novel, justified, and satisfying. While I prefer Ashley Johnson's Ellie when it comes to delivering casual and serious dialogue, I greatly prefer Bella Ramsey's aggression. I think Johnson comes off as cute compared to Ramsey's delivery. You could just hear the venom in her voice. It's great. Tell them that Ellie is the little girl who broke your fucking finger. Tell them that Ellie is the little girl who broke your fucking finger. And I could go on and on, but overall, the show does a good job introducing changes that explore the game's themes in new ways, all the while staying true to their original source material. Like Tess, I felt the same way when she died in both the game and in the show. Absolutely nothing. And yes, while being super faithful to the original source material means transferring the best qualities of the game, it also means some of the less than stellar aspects of the story is transferred as well. And if we're gonna talk about opinions, I think it's fair to explore my opinions and where I think the story has faltered, starting with Tess. She's just kinda there to move the plot along, to be the one to convince Joel that Ellie is worth risking their lives for, the do-it-for-me character, and I didn't see her as anything beyond that. And I didn't really care for Marlene's death either, her death didn't have much weight to me. She appears in the beginning and then in the end, to the point I forgot she was even a character. And while they did add that scene with Marlene and Ellie's mom, that wasn't enough for me to care for her. And as far as making me care for minor characters who scarcely turn up who end up dying during a big shootout, under the banner of an HBO show, I've seen it done better. And while it may seem like a tall order for us to care about this large cast of characters in a small amount of time, I'd argue that's a poor excuse. You've got something like FX's The Bear, being able to introduce you to a wide cast of characters, all of which are filled to the brim with personality. And I prefer any of them over someone like Marlene or Tess. Which is unfortunate to say, because the show is able to introduce a character within a single episode and make them a compelling presence, like David. He has this polite and pleasant presence that makes a nice contrast to his unethical pragmatism and how he justifies his actions. Overall, it's a great episode, and seeing him die, Ellie traumatized, and Joel caring for her creates a satisfying ending that's a good setup for the final episode. And unlike Marlene's new scene, David gets improvements from the changes that make him less shallow. They make him a pastor, you actually see his community, and they intertwine his religious beliefs to the cordyceps. This isn't the most complex character ever, but this is more fleshed out than David in the game. And I wish I found Tess and Marlene more interesting in the show like I did with David. I do have one complaint though. Oh, I thought you already knew. The fighting is the part I like the most. I feel like this doesn't add much to the story. Like, I think this episode is great because he's one of the few characters to outwit Ellie, or at the very least, find Ellie in a vulnerable position. And him wanting to care for Ellie and assimilate her since he sees promise in Ellie's rebellious attitude seemed like a fine enough motivation. But making him a kid lover, it seems extreme and unnecessary. It seems like David Cage level writing in the show. 
this works better in the game because at least Game David was just some charismatic scummy guy. The game hinting at him at being a pedo here is an addition I don't mind because he's just pure scum. Whereas show David, if you took out that line, would make no difference at all. In fact, adding this line makes his character feel unfocused. I'd like to think that David thinks he's a just person, making immoral decisions because he deems it necessary in order to survive as a species. So the reveal of him being a pedo who enjoys sexual assault takes away from the impact of him grappling with his distorted morality and shame. It was a last resort. You think it doesn't shame me? But what was I supposed to do? Let them starve? But I'm assuming that this reveal is supposed to explore the theme of love on a more extreme lens. So my generous interpretation of this extreme is that his admiration for the cordyceps way of spreading is what leads him to justifying his desire to repopulate the world at all costs. Which is in line with the show's goals to parallel David with organized religions and supremacists. But I think him being a false prophet, ruling through intimidation, and resorting to desperate cannibalism already achieves that, and you didn't need him to be a rapist pedophile who says this line. It's an extreme that I feel could have been explored more through another character, or not at all. And I feel like a pastor who controls through violence and feels like he knows best by doing things that brings him shame can stand on its own legs. And personally, a man who thinks he's a just and right person, who's forced into difficult situations, is more interesting than a creep who enjoys being a creep. And that's basically why I think this reveal doesn't do anything for me. Unlike that one Black Mirror episode where it's revealed a character as a pedo, that shook me and I felt disgusted. That reveal worked, instead of this where I just went, oh, he's a pedo. Ugh, okay, whatever. So, besides that David Cage-esque unnecessary detail, really good episode. So yeah, while this video had me praising the show and confronting complaints that don't take the show for what it is, I think it's fair to express my complaints that have a bit more reason than the gays ruined my zombie show. And as great as the show is, I'd be lying if I said that it's perfect, whether it be the narrative elements that stayed true to the source material or the changes that were introduced. There are some things that bothered me, some major, some minor, such as Tessa's death. While I prefer the Cordyceps being the cause of death over Fedra, since it doesn't make sense for Fedra to be this far out, the inclusion of this kiss during her final moments feels weird. The reason why this kiss exists is to subvert one's expectations. Cause you know the trope, right? In zombie stories, when one succumbs to an infection, the direction is either to make it a sad scene or a scary scene. But instead of either of these options, the show wanted to portray this scene as intimate. And since the theme of the show is love, it seems to fall in line. In fact, the showrunners mention wanting the cordyceps to still appear human, to still appear beautiful in a way. But despite all their attempts, the scene still appears awkward and kinda cliche. As the zombie makes out with the lady who has no control over her body, she uses her last bit of control to spark up the lighter and blow up the building. In an attempt to make the scene more intimate and emotional, I just ended up feeling weirded out. And not in a good way. It's a weird change, but I can get over it easily. But a major change introduced in the adaptation that's a bit harder to ignore is the addition of Kathleen, literally the most boring character in the show. Now regarding the theme of love, she's a lady that justifies her extreme actions due to her dead brother. He was a leader that everyone admired, but despite that admiration, he never achieved much as a leader. His complacency and passivity led to his death. So Kathleen wishes to honor him by making the tough decisions he couldn't. This is then contrasted to her soft-spoken personality. But in all honesty, I don't buy her intimidation. She just kinda says things and people follow suit. Especially when her right-hand man, Perry, is acting adjacent to her. Their acting isn't necessarily awful, but I don't believe what they're selling. Especially when the series has a similar dynamic in episode 8 that is leaps and bounds beyond Kathleen and Perry. Which is unfortunate because I've seen the pair do quality work before. 
And it sucks that I don't care about them, because the scene where they die is one of the most visually engaging moments in the season. And it goes to show that while a character can be in total alignment with the show's goals, execution can make it all fall flat on its face. Sometimes it hits, sometimes it misses, and thankfully the worse it gets is with Kathleen. Other decisions are more or less between good, serviceable, and sensible. And that's how I feel about the show most of the time, it makes sensible decisions, and while I wish I found other aspects of the show more unique, I can understand why the show is the way it is. Like, I wish Fedra and the Fireflies were more interesting, since they pretty much feel like set dressing. Children of Men has basically the same thing, but better, and that was from 2006. Which makes the game feel uninspired by comparison, and even more so when the show released in 2023. But the show focusing on its characters rather than making a brand new unique setting is probably the reason why the setting plays it safe. So if you're here for a harrowing experience or a unique post-apocalyptic setting, you best look elsewhere. It's just a show that features zombies. This was more of an issue in the game, since the lack of enemy variety made the game feel stale at points, but since constant combat and stealth isn't a necessity in TV, then this problem isn't present in the adaptation. It would be like complaining about Shaun of the Dead for having generic zombies. The movie wanted to be a comedy, and that movie succeeded greatly. And for The Last of Us, it's a show that focuses on love during the apocalypse. Any attempt to do anything more than that might have distracted from the show's goals, so I think the simplistic factions and zombies end up serving the show's focus for the better. And at least, Part 2's adaptation will have more opportunities to make its setting more interesting. But yeah, overall, the show did a pretty good job. A job so good that the show is able to stand on its own, not reliant on you loving the game in order to be invested in these characters. And I know that because I'm someone who didn't play the games prior who ended up enjoying the series, and I'm sure a lot of people who don't play games will see this story for the first time this way too. Because at the end of the day, there will be people who aren't interested in playing the game. So if you want to introduce an audience who are not aware of the stories games possess, or even an audience who plays games but just doesn't care about this particular genre of game, then an adaptation is the best way to do it. Because while games are great, sometimes we're in the mood to just sit back and enjoy some passive media. Much the same way some people love the Lord of the Rings films, but would never have the interest to either read or listen to an audiobook of the literature. It's just different strokes for different folks, and the show offers a better medium to experience the story than a let's play of the game, so I think the show is totally justified to exist. Especially since it's a show that's confident in its own identity, meaning it doesn't add or change things just for the sake of it. Instead, it introduces changes to explore new avenues the game hasn't done before. And while I personally addressed some of my criticisms about the show, I'd like to think they're more justified than these other complaints I've showed in the beginning. Complaints that aren't interested in what the show is trying to offer them, and that's unfortunate. And I'd like to think that they're just misguided opinions. I mean, for the most part. You can't really do anything about them, you know? And before anyone says this, I wouldn't call myself a fanboy of the franchise. I only finished both the games this year after watching the show, and the show is not even my favorite new show to come out this year. That award goes to Beef. Go watch Beef. Paul, turn that down! Paul, turn that shit off, dude! I almost lit a baby on fire! Anyway, all I want to do with this video is just nudge the discourse in a direction where we look at the show's goals and see what it's trying to communicate, then seeing if it actually succeeds. And I think it does. Not perfectly, mind you, but the highs are high enough that I think it deserved a video. In fact, I like the adaptation so much that I think the show is better than the source material, due to the game's mediocre mechanics failing to reinforce its own themes. As a result, The Last of Us as a game feels pretty meh, but that's another video for another time. And regardless of my preferences, while it's nice to know that video games contain stories that people outside this sphere can enjoy, I don't care about convincing others about why this hobby is worth my time. Not everyone needs to like the hobbies I like, you know? And if people are eager to check out games now because of the show, great. And if other people still think that games are a lesser medium, 
then who cares? Instead of trying to convince the unconvinced, I would rather spend my time convincing people who are already interested in the gaming space to check out games they haven't heard of that they might enjoy. Because I know games have great narratives, that's the reason why I talk about games on this channel, and I don't need a well-made TV adaptation to tell me that. The only thing this adaptation tells me, alongside Part 2's existence, is that Druckmann's storytelling is better suited for a passive medium, and I hope the changes introduced in Part 2's adaptation elevate the source material greatly. Because Part 2, as a game, has some issues. But that's another video for another time. Like, literally. I already have the script ready to go. In fact, the video might be out right now. And if not, it's in the works and it takes quite a while. And because of this, it's not the smartest thing money-wise, especially when YouTube decides to not pay me for a video I've made for no good reason. So if you enjoy my work and want me to keep on making these highly edited videos, then consider joining my Patreon. You get behind the scenes content, a Discord channel where you can interact with me and other patrons, and even get a shout out from me at the end of the video. Also, forgot to mention this, alongside getting your name credited at the end of the video. So if you want to help me out, then please support me on my Patreon or hit the join button down below. If you're financially stable, there's even a free trial period if you want to peep the patron and see what the community is like. And regardless of how you support me, whether it be through patron or watching to the end or even just watching like 10 seconds of this video, it really does mean a lot. So yeah, that's it. Um, I think it's time for like shout outs and commission stuff. I don't know how to transition to this, sorry. <laughs> All right, uh, shout out to Gob Gob. Sydney Montoya, Carl Durocher, Halo Azul123, Random Space Marine, Aiden Ali, Toner B, Emotech, Taboo TV Cat, Enormous98, Save the Joy, Sylph, Kyo? Kayo, Kyo, Kayo, Kyo, Kayo, Chromatic Elegy, Aerobic, Aerobrock, Seti, Melfus One, Higher to the Throne of Haphazard, Discellaneous, Trevor Hoppin, Parker Murphy, Detective Nanami, Lava Man, Cobra the Iron Warrior, Win Mortific, Noah Fillion, Outspoken Wee, Celestion, Buff Weeaboo, Cake Cuber, Skylar, Tootbutt, Psycho Groove 77. And yeah, that's basically it. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the support and all that sort of stuff. Cool. Peace.